Let's review some terminology and notation. This is probably familiar to you uh, from your prior courses in probability, but we'll soldier on through it anyway. Uh, this little epsilon symbol here uh, means is a member of. So if you write little a and then that epsilon thing in a big A, it means a is a member of the set A. So uh, you are a student, you're a member of the class of ISE 331. Uh, and you write a sideways U, like this one here, A and then a U and then a B, it means A is a subset of B. So in other words, anything that belongs to A also belongs to B. Um, sometimes you will see people disambiguate things a bit with these other two symbols here. Uh, this first one here at the left, where you draw a little vertical line under it, uh, means that you're, you're sort of explicitly emphasizing that A might be equal to B. Like A is A is at least, you know, A is contained in B, but it might actually be the entirety of it. Um, that usually goes without saying with this symbol anyway. Uh, but sometimes you put that in there just to like point out, hey, by the way, they might be equal. Um, in, in context, or rather in practice, this is almost never an issue. Uh, it's, it's pretty much always clear what, what, what is meant when you write these kinds of things. Or, or this one here, when you draw a line and a slash through it. Uh, that means A is a strict subset of B. So A is contained in B, but it isn't all of B. So it's, it's you know, strictly inside it. Uh, you'd say it's a strict subset. When you write this upside down U, like this one there, uh, we call that a cap, uh, a cap B. Uh, it means A intersect B. So stuff that belongs to A and B. So for example, um, ISC students in ISC 331 and students in ISC 330. Uh, you might look at the intersection of those two sets, and that's, that's actually a lot of you judging on my uh, enrollment here. Um, in the book, uh, for some reason, they decide to not use that symbol, and they just write A, B. Um, I, I am not a fan of that in practice. I like to actually write the upside down U to identify what's going on. Um, that's, uh, that's personal preference. If you don't like that symbol, you don't have to use it. Uh, I know what you mean. If you write a regular U like that, A and then a U and then a B, uh, that's uh, written as A union B, or that's how you would say that, A union B. And that just means anything that belongs to A or belongs to B or both. So it's, it's what you get when you, when you lumped A and B together. So, you know, students in ISE 331 and students in ISE 330. You could, you could say that group of all of those students collectively together. Um, if you write a little superscript C there, uh, that little C stands for complement. It means all the things that don't belong to A. You'd write that as A complement. So like uh, all the students who are not enrolled in ISE 331 would be ISE 331 and then a little C above it. Um, there's a lot of different notational conventions for that. Uh, other ones you'll see is uh, sometimes you'll write uh, A and then like a bar over it. That also would mean the complement. Um, or a tilde, sometimes you see that too. A with a tilde over it to mean the complement of A. Um, logicians sometimes like to put this symbol here. It's uh, uh, the not symbol next to it like that. You know, we, just, we just stick with the superscript C, but, but if you, you're reading on the internet, you'll see all kinds of other uh, notation more practices that people have for this too. Uh, next, let's see if I write, um, oh yeah, empty set is just an O with a slash through it. Uh, you probably know that one. Uh, what else have we got? Um, sample space. Okay, the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes of an experiment. Usually you use the letter S for that. So it's just all the possible things that could happen. Um, and it's all the, it's, it's the set of all the possible, um, results of that experiment. The best example is rolling uh, a die, right? Rolling a six-sided die, that's the numbers one through six. The sample space is the numbers one through six. Uh, an event is any subset of a sample space, uh, which you might write E and then subset S. So an event uh, for rolling a die would certainly be rolling a one, rolling a two, rolling a three, and so on and so forth. But it would also be things like rolling an odd number, which would be the union of rolling a one and a three and a five. Uh, disjoint, we'd say two events are disjoint if there's nothing in common. 
right? So rolling an odd number on a die and rolling an even number on a die, those are disjoint events because it's not possible for both of those things to happen. Uh, probability. Probability is a number associated with an event uh, that represents the fraction of times that event would happen if you repeat that experiment uh, you know, infinitely many times. Uh, and it's easy to sort of verify by the definition. Um, well, I guess it's mathematically it's defined axiomatically, but the, the, the following conditions are all, you know, I think pretty well understood or, or we can all agree on these. The first is that um, probability of any event has to be between zero and one, right? If I say the probability of something is 300, uh, 300% or, or, or three, you wouldn't know what that means. Um, the probability of the whole sample space has to be one, like because uh, the probability of something in the sample space happening has to be one, uh, because by definition, the sample space constitutes 100% of the outcomes. So the probability of, it would be like me saying rolling a die, the probability of getting a one through a six has to be one because nothing else could happen from that. Uh, and then for any two mutually exclusive events, sorry, I use the word disjoint to talk about two sets that have nothing in common. I forgot to point out that the word mutually exclusive means the same thing. Okay, disjoint and mutually exclusive mean the same thing. They, they, there's no distinction between those two. Uh, for any two disjoint or mutually exclusive events, uh, E1 and E2, the probability of their union, probability of E1 uh, union E2, uh, is the sum of their probabilities. Union of two events in probability terms would be the word or, right? If I talk about E1 and E2, two separate events, and I talk about the union of them, that's all the outcomes that belong to E1 or E2. So when I say E1 union E2, I'm actually saying E1 happens or E2 happens. Or both. So anytime you see the uh, anytime you see that union symbol there, um, that you can in, in your head you can say you substitute the word or. Uh, I wrote a union B. You can just as well think a a, a or uh, B. And then uh, the upside down uh, U, the intersection. Uh, I said that's a intersect B. Uh, you could pause the video for a moment and think about what that represents. Uh, if a union B is a or B, then a and the intersect and B would be all the things that belong to A and B, which means uh, that A and then that upside down U and then B would be uh, A and B. So both A and B have to happen. Both A and B have to be true. Uh, a lot of this stuff is made a lot easier with Venn diagrams. Okay, that, that really simplifies a lot of things. And we'll be using a lot of those uh, in this course. So let's do an example where you're rolling two dice and we'll say these dice are um, distinguishable, like one of them is red and one of them is white. And so you can look at, you can distinguish the, the first die versus the second. Um, typically when you think about rolling two dice, uh, right, you think of there as being 12 outcomes, like rolling a two, or no, 11 outcomes, because you can't roll a one. So you, two through 12 would be the numbers. Uh, we're actually gonna look at the uh, numbers on both of the dice here. So in that case, there are, um, 36 outcomes, right, which is what I've written here. So it's just all of the pairs of numbers from one to six. Like maybe the, maybe the first entry of each of these is the, the number on the red die, and then the second one is the number on the, on the white die or something like that. Okay, so three comma four is a member of the sample space because uh, one possible thing that could happen is that you roll a three on the uh, uh, red die. I forget which one I said goes first. You roll a three on the one and a four on the other. So notice that this sample space, I'll, I'll reiterate the point here, this sample space here distinguishes things like I'm going to do 4, 3 and 3, 4. Right? Those are two separate events. One is where you get a 3 on the white die and a 4 on the red, and the other one is a, is a 3 on the red die and a, and a 4 on the, on the white. So we're distinguishing those two events. That's why there are 36 possible outcomes here. I said that like three times, but I want to make sure it's totally clear. Uh, let's say E1 would be the event that the sum of the dice is odd. Okay, that's all these events that you see here. Not surprisingly, it's half of them, right? There's three in every row and three in every column. I've, I've, I've removed or hidden all the events that don't satisfy this. We'll let E2 uh, be the event that the sum of the dice is even. It's just all the other stuff. Uh, we'll say E3 will be the event that the sum of the two dice is prime. Uh, and that's these outcomes that you see here. Uh, we'll say E4 is the event that the values on each die are odd, 
And those are these nine possibilities that you see there. And then uh, E5 will be the event that the values on each die are uh, even, which is the ones I've, I've drawn there. Okay, why am I defining all these events? Well, it's just to do an example on the, on the next slide here where we look at intersections and unions and complements and things like that. Uh, I'm going to run through these pretty quickly because um, I think I only have to do a couple for each to, to sort of drive the point home. Uh, so probability of E1, for example, is 18 on 36. Uh, how did I get that? Well, E1 was the event that the sum of the two dice is odd, and you could just count these and say, yeah, there's, there's 18 uh, outcomes that we see there, and there's 36 total possibilities, so 18 on 36 is one half. Ditto for the other five. Okay, not, not very interesting here. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, disjoint pairs. So E1 intersect E2 is the empty set. Uh, E1 is the event that the dice, or the sum of the dice is, uh, is odd, and E2 is the event that the sum of the dice is even. So only one of those could happen. So E1 intersect E2 is the empty set. E1 intersect E4 is empty, and E1 intersect E5 is empty. Um, what are these here? E1 intersect E4 would be, um, so E1 is where you have an odd number on the sum, and E4 is the event that the values on each die are odd. Okay, but if the values on each of the die are odd, then the sum is even, and therefore E1 can't happen. So that's what's going on there. And, uh, you know, you don't need to do the, the rest of these here. I won't bore you with going through those. I, I think probably you can all work those out. Subsets. Uh, E4 is a subset of E2, and E5 is a subset of E2. Uh, E4 and E5 are the event where you, um, the sum of the, 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 either the sum of the, sorry, either each of the entries is odd or each of the entries is uh, even. And it's easy to see that if E4 or E5 happens, then that would have to imply that the sum of the dice is even. So E4 and E5 are both subsets of E2. So those are some subsets. Uh, complements, E1 complement is equal to E2, uh, and E2 complement is equal to E1, uh, because uh, either you roll an even or an odd number on the, on the sum of the two dice, so that's not so interesting. Uh, intersection, uh, that's a whole lot of text that doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Um, it's just intersecting the sets, taking, taking these various events and looking at the stuff that's common to them, and I've written it out there. There's... There's no particular insight there to be made. I'm just including it to be complete. Uh, let's do, so what we just did was an example of a sample space where you had a finite number of outcomes. You had, um, you know, uh, you had 36 possibilities. Uh, the next example is one where you have uh, an infinite number of outcomes. And this is like, uh, you know, some games use dice. Uh, children's games in particular would use a, a spinner where you have a little a little arrow that's connected on a kind of a little axle and you'd flick that spinner and it would point at a point at various angles. Twister had this for example, although that's not a great example because the, the set of things you would point at was like finite. It was like 16 options or 20 or something. So not the best example there, but I think you can imagine what I'm describing here. You have a toy spinner, you flick it with your finger and it spins and it takes a random angle theta. And we're gonna assume that all the angles are equally likely. So it's equally likely to be pointing in, in any direction versus any other. In this situation here, the sample space is the interval 0 to 2 pi. We'll go with radians here. I just as well could have said 0 to 360, uh, but I'm just going to stick with uh, radians. And it's not a big deal, as you'll see later on, that I have a, a half open, half closed interval here. right? We'll say that the uh, interval uh, contains 0, but it does not contain 2 pi, because 0 and 2 pi are, are the same angle. So we'll, we'll, you know, cut it off by, by not allowing 2 pi to belong to that set. In probability theory, that kind of distinction almost never matters uh, for a very overt reason that the, the possibility of that happening is, is, is zero, or the probability of that uh, particular event is zero. So don't worry about that. If you're bothered by that half-open, half-closed interval, um, don't be. Just ignore it completely. Uh, we'll say E1 is going to be the event that the pointer lies to the right of the y-axis. So E1 is that you lie off here like that, okay, to the right of the y-axis. And I think we can all agree that the probability of that happening is pretty obviously one half because uh, it's half of the half of the um, half of the possible angles satisfy that. We'll say E3 or E2 rather is the event that the angle is less than or equal to pi. And that would be this thing over here like that. That would be this stuff. 
Okay, so uh, E2 is uh, the event that the angle is, greater, is less than or equal to pi. I think I might have misspoke before. Uh, you're less than or equal to pi, and so you're up there. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take, uh, I think we can all agree that the probability of each of these events is 1 half. And their intersection, E1 intersect E2, means you're lying to the right of the y-axis, and you're lying above the x-axis. Uh, your angle is less than pi, and so you'd be in this quadrant here. Um, and the probability of that happening is, um, is 1 fourth. Uh, and the intersection of that, the set of outcomes where both of these uh, conditions are met, is, is their intersection, which is just this interval there, 0 to uh, pi on 2. And uh, again, that half open, half closed interval, I, ignore that. It doesn't matter. Don't, don't, don't let that bother you. It's a completely unnecessary formality. This is going to be one of the, the rare events that we'll do a proof in this class. Uh, you're not going to need to do things like this, uh, although I would like to give you some examples of, of proofs and set theory. So uh, a lot of people would look at these two questions and really bonk at it and say, I don't, I don't know how to begin on this, and so I, I thought it would be valuable to show it to you. Um, the first one says, show that A intersect the quantity B union C is equal to A intersect B union uh, A intersect C. And then the next one has you prove that the complement of A union B is equal to the complement of A intersect the complement of B. You could follow through this proof if you like. I've written it out pretty explicitly. What I would rather do, though, is explain both of these just with pictures or with, with Venn diagrams. I think that communicates the point effectively without... Um, bothering through all that text. I mean, that text is not very clear. Uh, and on an exam, on a problem set, uh, I think a Venn diagram would be a perfectly fine way to illustrate that. So um, let's draw a picture. Let's draw A and B and C like that. So here's, here's a set A. Uh, this will be A, and this will be B, and this will be C down here. And oh my... There we go. Okay, it took, it took a few seconds to load in there. Good. There's A and B and C. And we'll say, okay, what is A intersected with B union C? Sorry, let me show you. What is um, uh, A intersect with uh, the quantity B union C? And we're, what we're going to try to prove is that this thing is equal to the quantity A intersect B union A intersect C. So what I would do here is I would just draw in this Venn diagram, what is this first one here? What is that? It's everything that's in A, and it also has to be in B or C. So uh, I could draw that. This would be much better if we were in person. I could actually sort of take multiple colors and, and draw this thing in a more sort of dynamic fashion. But you would just look through these various options here, and you'd say, okay, A intersect, B uh, union C is going to be all this stuff here like that. Okay, hopefully that fills in, which it does. Good. Uh, am I right on that? That's A intersect with B union C. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, and then if I wanted to do the other one, if I wanted to say, okay, well, what is this thing? What is A intersect B union with A intersect C? Well, let's draw A uh, intersect B first. Where is that? A intersect B, I'll do the hatching the other direction, is all this stuff like that. And then A uh, intersect C is all this stuff over here like that. And you're merging them together, and uh, those two are the same. Okay, ditto for, um, ditto for the, the next question, which says uh, to show that uh, A union B complement is equal to A complement intersected with B complement. So we'll do that one now too. So I'll say here's... Here's S, here's just, here's everything that could happen. And then here's A, sorry, here's A, and here's B. And we want to show that A union B, the complement of this stuff, so A union B complement, what is that? That's just all the stuff that isn't inside A union B, so that's just, all the cross hatching, all is is everything that lies outside of this stuff. Okay, it's it's all this stuff that lies outside of those, 
And we want to show that that is equal to A complement uh, intersect B complement. So what is A complement? A complement is anything outside of A as well as stuff that is in B. So I would actually do some cross-hatching in there too. That's A complement. But then you're intersecting with B complement too, which means that that, uh, that component there goes away. That's a terrible explanation, uh, but don't worry about it. That's, uh, that's as proofy as we're going to get in this class, so it's not a big deal. Conditional probability is uh, the name of uh, what we use to compute probabilities of events that depend on other events. Uh, so, for example, if you know that an event B is true, uh, that might affect the probability that some other event A is true, right? If you see someone holding an umbrella uh, walking along the street, there's probably, uh, it's more likely that it's going to rain today because maybe they read the weather forecast or something like that, right? Or if you see clouds on the horizon, it's likely that rain is going to uh, happen. Uh, the notation for that, which as I mentioned last time, is the bane of a lot of people's uh, success and probability. A lot of people really don't like this. Uh, you write that as probability of A and then a vertical line and then the letter B. And you would read that as the probability of A given that B is true or just the probability of A given B. Okay, that's what that means. So when you write, see that vertical line, it means the probability that A is true if you already know that B is true. Uh, and the mathematical definition of that is it's just this here. So the probability of A, given that B is true, is the probability of both of these two occurring, A intersect B, and then divided by the probability of B. So that's mathematically how that works. Two extreme examples are the following. If A and B are disjoint, then they have nothing in common, then what is true? Then if I tell you, well, we'll just work it out. Then what is the probability of A, given that B is true? Mathematically, it's the probability of A intersect B on the probability of B, just by the, the definition. Uh, but if they're disjoint, then A union B, uh, sorry, A intersect B is, is empty. And so the probability of that happening is zero. And so the probability of A given that B is true is zero. That isn't really surprising. Um, if I say, what's the probability that you have uh, you roll some dice and you see an odd number, given that the number is even, you'd say, yeah, that's, that's zero. That doesn't make any sense. So there isn't actually much content to that statement, but it's, it's a useful sanity check. Uh, if B is a subset of A, uh, then you have the opposite. Okay, let's work that one out. Probability of A, given that B is true, is uh, the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. And what is the probability of A intersect B? Well, if B is a subset of A, then B belongs to A, then A intersect B is just B, and therefore you have a probability that is 1. Let me draw a picture of that, because this is actually a lot simpler than it sounds. Um, here is, uh, so what am I drawing there? Let's take, here's A, and what did I, I said B is a subset of A, and here's B in there. Okay, and now we look at this and I say, okay, B is true, like you're lying somewhere in B. Okay, so is A also true? Well, yeah, because B is inside of A. So if you're inside B, you're inside A. It's like saying if you're inside Paris, you must be inside France. The same kind of reasoning there. Okay, so if B is a subset of A, if B is inside A, then any time uh, you're in B, you're also in A, and so the probability of A given B is one. Uh, so in particular here, so I, the, the main fact that I used is that uh, probability of A intersect B is equal to the probability of B. Why is that true? That's true just because in this picture here, A intersect B is all the stuff that belongs to A uh, and B, but A intersect B is, is just B because B is inside of A. So that's how that works out. Uh, let's do some examples with dice. Um, if the two dice have different numbers showing, what's the probability that at least one of them has the number six on it? So how do we work that one out? Um, so we'll let B be the event that the two numbers showing are different. Uh, so if the dice have different numbers showing, what is the probability that at least one of them has the number six? Uh, if uh, so, it's easy to go. If you go back to that table with the um, 
with the 36 different outcomes, you could easily just work out that 30 of those happen to satisfy this. I won't bother to do that. You could, you could easily work that out yourselves. The probability of B, different numbers showing, is 5 on 6. Okay, and A is the event that at least one die has the number 6 on it, and it's easy to see that the probability of A intersect B is 5 on 18. Again, how would you do this? You'd go back to that table with 36 possibilities, and you'd just count the entries that satisfy that. You'd find that there are 10 that do. That's all I would do for that. There's no fancy trick to it. And so what is the probability of A given B? Well, by definition, the probability of A given B, if I just skip back here for a minute, is this thing. Right, it's the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. And I just calculated these two values here. I just worked out probability of uh, B and the probability of A intersect B. And so I just divide the one by the other and I get one third. That's how that works. Uh, here's an example of conditional probability being used in the opposite direction. And here's what I mean by this. If I have, um, so the expression that I had, the definition of conditional probability is that the probability of A, given that B is true, is going to be equal to the probability of A intersect B. Again, this is just what I wrote a few slides ago, and I'm just copying it down again, divided by the probability of B. Okay, I'm going to do something that... Uh, looks really obvious at first, but it ends up being useful for this problem here. And that is that I'm gonna rewrite this by multiplying either side by probability of B, and I'm gonna flip the um, left and right hand side. So I'm just gonna rewrite this as follows, probability of A and B, uh, that is equal to the probability of A, given that B is true, times the probability of B. Okay, nothing more than tedious algebra that I've done here, okay? And I'm going to claim to you that this is helpful for solving this problem, and here's why. Um, first, I'll tell you what the problem is. Uh, you have a drawer, a sock drawer. It has seven black socks and five white socks in it. And so you reach, uh, you open up the drawer, you keep your eyes closed, and you take out one sock, and you drop it on the floor, and you take another sock out, and you drop it on the floor. Okay, that's the process. You, so without replacement is something I've written there. It means you don't, after you drop that first sock, you don't put it back in. You close your eyes, take one sock out, and take another one. Um, we want to know what's the probability that both socks are black. And so why is this helpful here? So uh, to work this out using the uh, definitions we've already set up, what you would do is you would take, uh, it helps to, to write things as follows. Well, let B be the event that the first sock is black, okay, which is kind of weird. Uh, you, 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 the reason I'm, you, you'd think that A would be the event that the first sock is black because A comes before B. Uh, I'm going to use B instead because um, of the, I, we've already written probability of A given B twice and we're just going to stick with that convention. So um, I wouldn't expect you, there's no reason for you to know to do that ahead of time. So B will be the event that the first sock is black and certainly the probability of uh, B happening is 7 on 12, right? That's an easy one. The probability that the first sock is black, there's 7 black socks and 5 white, so 7 out of a total of 12 is 7 twelfths. Nothing interesting there. Okay, and we want probability of A intersect B. We want the prob sorry, B will be the event that the first sock is black, A will be the event that the second sock is black, and we want probability of A intersect B. Okay, and that's where this equation I've written comes in to be useful because I've written that the probability of A intersect B is equal to this thing over here, probability of A given B times probability of B. And I just worked out, or I just stated, that probability of B, which is the event that the first sock is black, is 7 on 12. And so what is the probability of A given B? Let's work that one out. Probability of A given B says, what's the probability that the first sock is black? That the first sock is black, that's, the, sorry. A given B, A is the second sock, I'm confusing myself. Uh, probability of A given B is the probability that the second sock is black, given that the first one was. Okay, so if the first sock was black, so we're given that B is true, given that the first sock that I reached in and pulled out was black, what happens after that? There are now 11 socks in that drawer of which six are black. And the probability of A given B, therefore, is six on 11. 
because we're given that uh, B happened. So we're given that the first sock was, uh, was black. And so given that that's true, you're now left with 11 socks, six of which are black. And so therefore probability of A given B is six on 11. And so therefore I can use this formula as I've uh, written there and I get uh, it's seven on 12 times six on 11, which is seven on 22. Uh, up there. That last bullet is an explanation of the, the thing I just described, so it makes my lecture notes complete. Independent events. Two events, A and B, we say they are independent if they are entirely unrelated to each other. Okay, I'll give the conceptual definition before the mathematical one. Two events are independent if they're, if we can agree uh, that there is no, that ne neither one has any impact on another. All right, whether uh, you know, whether my aunt has a ham or turkey sandwich for lunch tomorrow has no impact on um, uh, what time I go to bed, right? We can, I mean, there's butterfly effect and, you know, philosoph philosophers could talk about this for forever, but, um, you know, you, when you're building a mathematical model, you can kind of more or less agree that, yes, certain things simply are not related to certain other things. Can you prove that? Well, no, you can't prove anything about the real world, but we can probably agree on things like that. Okay, so two events are independent if they simply have nothing to do with one another. That doesn't mean that they're disjoint. That's actually a separate concept, and and uh, this is worth discussion because I've, I've um, I, I, this, this question gets asked a lot, particularly before exam reviews, and uh, I may pause. It might be a good idea to, to think about that for a minute uh, and, and, and think about how those two are different, um, but they're not. So A and B just means they don't have any impact on one another. Okay, They don't affect each other. Using this definition of conditional probability that we've just worked through, you'd say the probability of A, given that B is true, is just equal to the probability of A. Right? That's like saying, knowing that B is true, does not affect what I think about A. It says the probability of A, given that B is true, is just the probability of A. You don't care about whether B happens to be true or not. Um, so equivalently, you can say, if you apply the definition of conditional probability, it also means that the probability of A intersect B is the probability of A times the probability of B. That's basic algebra. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, work through it on your own. Maybe I'll put it on a problem set. I'm not sure. It's very simple algebra. It's like a two-line proof. Um, it's easy to show, and again, this could be a good problem set problem too, not very difficult, that if the probability of A uh, given B is equal to probability of A, so A and B are independent, then probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. So independence is commutative, right? In words and language, we know this is true. If A doesn't affect B, then B can't affect A. Right. That, that if, if I say they, they don't, are unrelated, then they're, they're unrelated. Then the, the sentence goes both ways. Uh, that also, um, you also can prove that this statement here about the way I've defined it is actually symmetric. That if A given B is equal to the probability of A, then B given A is also equal to the probability of B. That's, that's also true. Um, again, simple algebra. You can work it out if you like. It's, it's not very difficult. It falls right from the definitions. Uh, we'll look at some independent events, rolling two dice, just like we had before. So we'll say A is going to be the event that one of the dice shows the number 3. Um, and you can see that the probability of A is 11 on 36. Uh, B will be the event that the first die shows the number 3. And certainly the probability of B is uh, 1 sixth. Uh, C is going to be the event that the dice have the same value. And the probability of that is 1 on 6. And then D is the probability, uh, or the event, sorry, I think I've misspoken a couple times already. D is the event that the dice sum to seven, and the probability of D happening is one on six. We're going to see which of these events are independent. Uh, there are six pairs to check because you've got uh, four events, and there's six pairings of, of four events. Um, I won't bother to go through all of these. Uh, actually, the way you would compute any of these is just by evaluating these various probabilities and taking intersections and things like that. So I, I won't bore you by doing that, although if there are questions, I'm happy to address them. Uh, but let's just see which of these are independent. Uh, B is a subset of A, right? If the first die shows the number three, then certainly one of the dice shows the number three. So B and A are certainly not independent. In fact, B implies A. B is a subset of A, right? So B and A are not independent. Uh, as for A and C, A and C also are not independent because the probability of A intersects C is uh, 1 in 36. 
and uh, that gets you the probability of A, given that C is true, is, um, I can't read that number there. It's one sixth, which is not the probability of A. So A and C are not independent. Uh, we can work through the other ones too. Uh, there's not a lot that I really have to say about these. Uh, B and C are independent, uh, but A and D and B and D are not. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Bayes' formula is uh, an important theorem that lets you talk about the probability of B given A uh, in terms of the probability of A given B. And uh, it's this equation that you see here. Uh, this is sort of the short form of Bayes' formula that I, I like to use, although it's usually defined using something a little longer. Um, it says the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Okay, uh, easy to derive this from the definitions. Okay, I've been saying this a lot, but it is true. These are all like one line proofs of just doing algebra. Uh, Bayesian spam filtering. This used to be a thing. I'm pretty sure we're all using nothing but uh, natural language processing and, uh, and neural networks and so forth nowadays, so it's probably fallen out of style. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. Uh, nowadays, when I ask people to raise their hand and, and tell me if you've heard of this term, like no one raises it anymore, whereas a decade ago, most people had heard this term. Um, anyway, it, it is a thing, uh, Bayesian spam filtering. And so, so what does that mean? Um, well, what is a spam filter, right? A spam filter is an emailed thing where you get a message, it comes into your inbox, and uh, you have a, an algorithm that looks at the contents of that message, and it says, well, based on what I see in this message, I think this is probably spam, right? So how does that work? Um, we'll describe this in terms of Bayesian probabilities, or in, in terms of Bayes' formula, rather, and we'll show how this is useful. Uh, so A will be the event that an email is spam, and B will be the event that uh, the email contains the phrase uh, meet singles. Uh, that was the most safe for work phrase I could include in coming up with this example that seems to appear in, the, in spam often. Uh, so A is the event that it's spam and B is the event that it contains the phrase meet singles. And having said it that way, I think we can agree that a good spam filter should calculate this probability here. Right. If a message says meet singles or whatever the heck the word is or whatever data you're collecting, whether the IP address comes from a certain subdomain or the time of day it was sent at or, um, you know, the, the gifts it contains or whatever the heck it is, any kind of information. We're just this is a simple proof concept here. But you're given that it has this phrase meet singles. You want to know what is the probability that it's spam. Right. That is if the probability is high, you're going to throw that message away. That is the quantity you're interested in. Okay, and now we're going to use Bayes' rule or Bayes' formula to compute this, right? How do I get this? So if I wanted to calculate probability of A given B, I'd need to compute the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Now let's go through each of these items, okay? Let's figure out how you could compute these things and therefore how you could ultimately determine um, whether this message is spam or not. So what is probability of B given A? That's the probability that if you know, so if you know something is spam, so you're given that A is true, you're given that this, P, this uh, message is spam, what is the probability that it contains uh, the phrase meet singles? That's this thing over here, right? B given A says if something is spam, if I know it already to be spam, here's the probability that it happens to have that phrase. A given B on the other hand is if it has the phrase meet singles, what's the probability that it's spam? Okay, so you could figure out B given A. B given A you could do, but you could take huge uh, samples of emails and uh, you could say, um, well, actually that's, that's the most complex one. I'll do things in the order of the bullets, sorry. So uh, let's look at these other two first. I, I got ahead of myself and, and jumped the gun when I did that B given A. The, the bullets go in a different order, so we'll kill that. Um, by taking, yeah, by taking large samples of email, you could say, okay, what is the probability of A? What is the probability that any message is spam, right? You could compute that. You just, you know, open up your inbox and sit around twiddling your thumbs for a few months and then just say, oh, look, you know, uh, 50% of all of my email was spam or whatever the number is. Okay. That's, that's probability of A. It's just the total fraction of all of the, um, uh, email out there that is spam. I suspect it's a lot higher than 50%, to be honest. If anyone knows that number, uh, leave a comment below or shoot me a message on Discord. I'd like to know. 
uh, probability of B is going to be um, what is the uh, probability that any message, spam or not, has that phrase meet singles in it. Okay, so B doesn't care about spam or not. B just says, do you have this phrase? And maybe a one in a hundred messages has that phrase. I suspect that's like orders of magnitude off, but again, it's a simple textbook example. Uh, okay, so we've got probability of A and probability of B. And uh, now you could collect a big sample of spam email uh, and you could determine that, let's say, uh, three out of every 200 or 0.015 uh, spam emails has that phrase meet singles. Okay, so probability of B given A, which is that one I was talking about before and kind of jumped the gun, is a 0.015, let's say. Okay, so pull all these numbers together, uh, multiply everything. If you get a message and it has the phrase meet singles in it, then the probability that it is spam, if you plug in these numbers and plug in that theorem, would be 75%. So that's how that would work and that's how you use it. And that's a Bayesian spam filter. Um, if they still use that, which I kind of hope they do. Uh, righty. Um, now, I mentioned before that people often don't teach uh, Bayes' formula using this definition. Um, often they like to precede it by what's called the law of total probability. I never like to do that. Uh, I like to use this example first and then show the, the example where it's the context where it's more generally applied. Uh, so the law of total probability is, it's kind of an ugly thing. Uh, people don't like this one too. I'm going to try to make it as painless as I can. Uh, so what typically happens when you're looking at the uh, Bayes formula is that denominator there, probability of B, uh, that denominator usually um, is a lot bigger. It usually has a lot more stuff in it and, and it's because it's coming from this formula. So um, I'll draw an example here to show you what I mean uh, using what is called a partition. So we'll say, suppose that A1 through AN uh, form a partition of the sample space, and I'll draw a picture in just a minute. Uh, it means that their union covers the entire sample space and they're all disjoint. Um, informally, it just means that exactly one of those AIs must happen. Um, so if you're drawing a, car, a playing card out of a deck of playing cards, then one partition would be either you're going to see a face card, there will be a face on it, Jack Queen King, or you'll see an ace, or you'll see an odd number, or an even number. Right? That would be a partition. Exactly one of those four events happens. Uh, no more, no less. Right? Uh, we'll, we'll assume that an ace is not a face card. I guess poker players would sometimes call it that, but uh, we won't call it that here. We'll assume those are different. Um, a simpler example would just be a face card or not a face card. Right, that's a partition with two elements in it. You either have a face card or you don't. That's the world's simplest partition is a thing or not a thing, which is what that example illustrates. Um, yeah, that's what that bullet there says. Uh, for any event A, the pair A and A complement is always a partition. So I've jumped the gun again. If you're rolling two dice, um, either the sum of the dice is odd. Well, a partition for rolling two dice is that uh, you could have a one be the sum of the dice is odd. Uh, or both numbers are even, or both numbers are odd. Okay, that's a way of breaking up rolling two dice into uh, into two pieces there. Uh, sorry, into three three pieces. The picture that you usually see drawn with a partition is that you'd have your sample space like this, and keep everything aligned. You'd have your sample space. This is S. Did I do that? Okay, yeah, I'll call it S. A nice rectangle and a partition. These examples I've given you really just means that you have a bunch of events and those events, when you lump them all together, they, they cover the entire sample space as I've drawn here. And in addition, no two of those events overlap. So this would be A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6. All right, that's a partition of six elements. It's a Venn diagram that I've drawn where basically it's exactly one of these events has to happen, right? If you, anywhere you lie in S, if I happen to lie on this little blip right there, oh, look, I landed in A6. I didn't land in A1 through A5. I only landed in A6. Uh, so the law of total probability lets me talk about um, uh, the probability of an event occurring, the conditional probability of an event occurring uh, which I will call B, and I'm going to draw it like this. And B is going to be an event that has nothing to do with these A's here. It's just some some event lying here in the middle of 
in the middle of the sample space like that. Okay, and uh, the law of total probability says that the probability of B is equal to uh, the probability of B given that A1 is true times the probability of A1 summed all the way up through the probability of, let's say there's n events in the partition, in this case n was 6, I drew 6 pieces, uh, plus the probability of B given a n times the probability of a n. That's the law of total probability. Um, people don't like it because it's a sum of a lot of ugly things. Uh, so that's the, the law of total probability, and so therefore you usually use this bit here as the denominator in base formula. If I go back to base formula, you can see that um, I have a probability of B in the denominator. Um, if my mouse will be so kind as to skip back, I hope it does. You can see here that the denominator in base formula has a probability of B in it. And so the full version of Bayes' formula, as uh, I was just saying a moment ago, is uh, it just involves expanding that denominator by using this law of total probability here. And so that's uh, how that is written. So this is when most people define Bayes' formula, this is what they have in mind. Ooh, that box just exited right out. Is this thing here. And so the real change here is just that instead of an A and a B, I have an A sub I in B because we think of these A's as belonging to a partition. And the numerator doesn't change and the denominator instead of being uh, just probability of B, we generally expand it out. 